Hello, hello. This is Yuri of Moving Sales Professionals. We are here for an epi- another episode of our podcast. And today we have a real treat with us. We got Ed Katz. He is the self-proclaimed, self-ordained minister of office moving. He runs the International Office Moving Institute, IOMI, that offers in-person and online office moving training for movers. He is the founder and former owner of Peachtree Movers in Atlanta, Georgia. During the 24 years that he ran the company, Peachtree did more than 50,000 local office moves. How are you doing today, Ed? I'm tired from lifting all that furniture, but I'm doing great. I hope you're doing well, Yuri. I am. I am. And I'm very, once again, I'm very uh, pleased that we could have you on. We always try to have people that will entertain and, uh, pro- of course, teach for the current moving company owners and also new entrants to the marketplace. So we really... Uh, it's really great to have you on. Thank you so much. I'm my so, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, Ed, why do you think this might be a good time for HHG movers to diversify into office moving, so household goods movers? Well, I think we've all read and heard on TV and read in the newspapers and magazines that everybody's predicting 2023 is going to be a down year in terms of sales of residential uh, the, the residential market. Goldman Sachs came out with a prediction that residential house sales, home sales, are expected to be down 17 to 23 percent. You know, 30 experts, right? Big articles of promotion about that. I have clients all over North America, you know, Canada and the USA. And from what I hear from them, it really didn't slow down till maybe a few weeks ago, that they were still going gangbusters, still doing residential moves. I would say, though, on average, my very unsophisticated, unscientific feedback from my clients who take my online training, that their household gold, household goods business is down approximately, I'd say, 25 to 30 percent on average is what I'm hearing. It's like somebody pulled the plug on it. Mm. That's interesting. I'm actually, I'm not seeing a lot happening in terms of our clients and across the board, across the U.S. that we're working with, of course. Uh, what I'm actually seeing, I'm seeing a lot of activity for March and April. February itself, February for February is very slow, but there's a lot of moves that are being booked in February for March and April, which is consistent to years past so i'm certainly seeing that on my end but i mean i it it depends different parts of the country go different canada may be a little different so it's uh it's a little different in that regard so that's actually interesting for me in canada because that's something that we're very much focused on and to get into that market and by the way everybody congratulate us we're up and live and we are in uk a hundred percent we already we, we got our first lead. It's it's exciting. We're very excited about that. So we're working on it. We're working with a company out of BCP. May I wave to somebody and say hello, Simon Darvell, who is my largest client in the UK with seven locations all over the United Kingdom and an IOMI trained and certified office mover. Let me know if I can say hello to him. Hi, Simon. And Simon, I would love to talk to you. <laughs> Anyway, getting back getting back to our questions here. So, Ed, you said that you discussed the pros and cons of office moving. What is one of the benefits? I think the number one benefit to me is I started off as a local mover in Atlanta. I did everything I could to generate revenue. We did apartment moves, house moves, and office moves until we specialized 100% in local office moves. And I remember the days of the crazies, that's what I call them, the crazies. You know, I'd have an irate shipper yelling and screaming at me over the phone that your men are sweating on our my brand new satin sofa. You know, it's in August and, you know, in Atlanta, it's 95 degrees outside, humid, we're sweating on our satin sofa, or we've tracked Georgia red clay in on and ruined all their beige carpeting. What are we gonna do about it? And, I just couldn't wait to get out of the household good arena and into the O and I arena. And I have found over the years, if you look at the numbers, now you have to understand this is 2000 data. 
you know, no inflation factor. So 2000, in 2000, when I sold the company, we were doing 4 million a year in local office moving. Today, that's like inflationary numbers, seven and a half million. But putting into perspective, we did 4 million a year, 4 million a year in local office moving. We had about $7,000 in total claims, not workers comp, but real property and cargo claims 7,000 a year, that's not even on the radar screen. And I think one of the reasons is because most people that you move in the office moving arena are not emotionally involved with their furniture. They're hired hands. They're employees of the company you're moving. Their furniture is already distressed. It's already antique. It already has rubs, scratches, nicks, dents, and gouges on it. And unless you go in and destroy the furniture, they could care less. They're not emotionally involved like they are. You know, I moved somebody's house and we destroyed a chair out of one chair. We only destroyed one chair out, out of 10 chairs are all set you know, for a dining room table. And she had inherited it from her grand, grand aunt who died, great aunt who had died years earlier. I mean, you don't have that in the office moving arena. So I think that's one of the biggest benefit benefits to the owner or the general manager, P-O-M-G. So P-O-M-G. less mental baggage, you're saying, basically. Yeah. Peace of mind guaranteed, P-O-M-G for the owner of the company. So like I said, less mental baggage. Yes. And that really is a major, I think, major reason. I think we still damage furniture, but nobody cares. <laughs> okay. Any more benefits that you can think of? Well... To me, I used to get phone calls in the beginning when I did everything local. You know, hey, you just destroyed our mailbox. Anybody in our listening audience ever have a truck back over a mailbox? And it's not just the mailbox. What are you going to do about our lawn? You know, we want a whole new lawn sod. You know, we want sod lawn, Bermuda grass or whatever, soysha. You name it, we bought it when we did residential moves. You have an obstacle course when you're doing residential moves. Brand new truck, back the truck down the driveway. It's like nails scratching the side of the the truck, the logo, the paint job, I mean, everything that our our trucks got scratched and dented from the obstacle course backing down a driveway to get closer to the front door. Oh, speaking of driveways, your mover's truck weighed so much they cracked our cement driveway. What are you gonna do about it? I mean. Uh, that looks like an old crack to me. But all the things you have on a residential move, you normally don't have on an office move, therefore less chance of having damage. No pool tables. Hmm. No grandfather clocks. Hmm. No glass dining room tables. Hmm. No hanging chandeliers that you might destroy as you're carrying something tall down the spiral, spiral staircase. Right? <laughs> No I spiral mean, staircases, mostly in the offices. You just don't have all these obstacles on an office move. A lot of times you back up to a loading dock, you go through a freight corridor. It's already damaged because that's where all the cargo, whatever they're hauling, freight goes in and out of the building. Or you single story building, you you know, you back up to the front door of the building. And I mean, you, you, you don't have these obstacles. So it's easier. I like easier. I'd like user-friendly for the owner. <laughs> yeah, I can definitely understand that. I've had to deal with those those conversations, both local and, and office moves. And yeah, office moves generally, other than the time that it may take longer because of those long hallways that you don't have on local moving and freight elevators and, all, and things like that. And obviously with uh, office moving, there's only so much you can really stack because of what it is. So yep. you can't really, you don't have sofas that you can stack on top of each other. You may have heavy filing cabinets or heavy desks and you can only stack so high. So you may need more trucks or you may need more trips to do with that type of stuff. Okay. Well, that point, we- that point your dovetails into the next point I was going to cover. Maybe you're going to ask me about, are there any other benefits? And, I, and, I, and it dovetails exactly to the point you just covered. We never stacked furniture on the floor of the truck 
That's why even Ed Katz could go out on a move. So once we place a piece of furniture on a four-wheel doll, you're on a panel cart or in a speed pack, it stayed in the container or on the cart or on the dolly until it arrived safely inside the new location. In other words, as far as I was concerned, that truck was like an elevator. You pushed it on, you pushed it off. Yeah, you patted it. You positioned it where you wanted it on the truck and you tied it off. But other than that, we didn't stack anything floor to ceiling. I mean, the skill level was so much lower. I'm not a visual person. If you told me, go upstairs and get something to fit in the hole so we can build a tier and stack it floor to ceiling, you'd be there all day because I wouldn't know. I'm not a visual person. But even I, who am a salesperson, can you tell, not an operations person, I <laughs> load a moving van with our IOMI, I-O-M-I, process that we teach because we're, we're not stacking floor to ceiling. We're not putting a puzzle together. Does that make sense? Sure. You know, in, in the residential arena, the load itself secures the load. The load itself secures the load. Everything fits together, locked it in place. Not on an office move. It's not that way at all. So the benefit is this. No lifting, carrying, stacking. Much lower workers' comp claims. Our insurance company thought this thought the sun rose and set on my moving company, Peachtree Movers, because our loss ratio was so low. Really was. And mm -hmm. so, how did that affect your profit margins? Well, I just want to make one more point before I answer that question. We are you sitting down, Yuri? Listeners, are you sitting down? This is blasphemy, blasphemy, but I'm going to share it with you. When I owned Peachtree Movers, we did not do step moves. Did you hear me? We didn't do step moves. We would do moves with high-rise buildings with elevators or single-story buildings. Or if there was a two-story building with an outside wraparound walkway with a railing, we could maybe cut the railing and use a scissor slip to get the furniture from the top floor down to the truck or vice versa. So if a prospect called and had a move from a suburban office building where there are four flights of steps or six or eight or whatever, we'd say, you really need to call a residential mover. And I say to myself, let them hurt their backs. Let them, mm -hmm. it's always your best employees who are going to be on the steps, the most experienced best employees are going to hurt their backs. And I used to say to myself, and let them sling your furniture up and down the steps and damage the walls and damage the furniture. We just didn't do them. In fact, one time we did a hybrid step move. I remember we did all the moves for a Fortune 500 company that uh, was really growing tremendously in Atlanta. And they bought another company. And the company they bought had to merge into their headquarters building in Atlanta. And we were, of course, their movers. So unfortunately, it was a step building that they were moving from into their headquarters. So all I did was hire a household good residential mover to come in. And I told my client this, is this okay? They said, yeah, we don't care. And they and the other moving company carried the furniture from the second floor down to the lobby. We picked it up from there and did the move. And the other moving company employee said, you guys are a bunch of wizards. And we we're like, yeah, you guys are a bunch of idiots. You know, do you realize if you work for me as a mover and we fired you or you quit, whatever, and you went to work for another moving company, it probably lasts about what, a day when you see what you had to do with working for other movers. So how did this, you asked me, how does this affect profit margins? We, on average, had a 50% gross profit margin. And may I please have your permission to define what I call a profit mar a gross profit margin? What sure, of course. Revenue? So let's make it simple. Let's say it's a $10,000 local office move, not interstate, not an agent for anybody, just a local office move, hourly labor, our employees. So we subtract, of course, what? The labor of doing the move, right? Mm -hmm. The cost of the pack material. I owned all my equipment, but if I had to rent a truck, see, back in the day, we didn't know our cost of doing sales 
you know, were at that time. But here's how we backed into it through another door and got pretty accurate information. So I subtract the labor, the material. And then I say, if I had to rent the truck I own, what would it cost for a day? Hmm. Subtract that. I owned a thousand four-wheel dollies because of the revenue we did. But if I didn't own the equipment and I had to rent it, what would it cost? Subtract that. Here's where I break from the pack. We would also subtract the sales person's commission. And let's just pretend we paid him perks, benefits, with all his costs, 8% of revenue. So out of the $10,000 revenue local office move, Yuri, the material, the cost of the truck, the cost of the equipment, the labor to do the move, and the salesperson's commission would have $5,000 of cost. So $5,000 is, of course, 50% gross profit margin. That's what we shot for. And then EBITDA. Does anybody know what EBITDA means? I don't know. I'll be honest. Well, well you do know, but you just know. Well, maybe I do. I don't know. So when I sold my company, they said, we're going to sell. One of the ways we figure out what your company is worth, we're going to look at EBITDA. I said, I don't know anybody by the name of EBITDA. No, 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 you idiot. EBITDA is earnings before interest and taxes. Ah, uh -huh. Earnings before. So they said, how much do you pay yourself? And you, and I, okay. Do you have any perks? Is my name Ed Katz? Do I have any perks? Country club, eating out, car expense, travel expense. We're going to take all that baggage that you have it incurred, and we're going to add that back to your net before taxes you got that add that back before so i got my salary but then i go whoa wow that all those perks equal a lot you know and that's what i'm going to add that back now you have interest on loans you have long-term debt because you own 11 trucks right you got long-term debt and you have a line of credit because you bill a lot of the customers that you move so you have a rolling line of credit we're going to add the not the debt back but we're going to add the interest on the debt back ah so perks, you know, my compensation, and then we have depreciation. Now, in my book, depreciation is a real charge, but for coming up with the value of a company, add back the depreciation. So the depreciation on the trucks and the equipment, my perks, my salary, and interest. You got all that? Yeah. Now, let's subtract that. And, and then, so they add that back to your net before taxes. Now they say, okay, a $4 million company, you're gonna to have to pay somebody like 200,000, 225,000 a year to run this company when you're gone. We're gonna subtract that from this, this theoretical profit we just came up with. And that's how they come up with EBITDA, adding back those expenses and then subtracting what it would cost to have somebody else run the company. So then our return on our revenue was this. We tried to have a net before taxes, net before taxes, adding all this in and subtracting what I just said, of around 23, 24, 25%. That's not bad for an, a, a company in the moving industry, is it? No, not at all. So that's what we shot for. Because I said, if Bill Gates can make the net before taxes that he makes with Microsoft, his risk doesn't hold a candle to Ed Katz's risk. I'm charging this much money for the premium service we render. We're going to charge a premium price. We right. never set the price. We were never the biggest mover. We are all about profit, not how much revenue do you do. Right. It's kind of the same thing. Like uh, I was just recently in October at a Louis Massaro event. And you have a bunch of people talking about, well, how much do you gross? How much do you gross? How much do you gross? You had, I remember this one company out of, I believe they were either Oregon or Washington State. Can't remember the name right now. But uh, they were constantly asking and writing down how much everybody's gross was. And at one point, after I heard them ask the question probably five to ten times, I turned to them and I said, why do you keep asking this? It doesn't matter what they gross. What matters is what they take home. Because, for example, you have on the East Coast where we're based, you may have a company that grosses 
for example, $10 million, right? And then in California, you may have a company that grosses $20 million, right? Mm -hmm. So on paper, it looks great. Like, wow, they're making double that. But reality is this. Here on the East Coast, truck rental costs a little bit less. Warehouse costs less. Materials cost less. Taxes are lower. Gas is lower. All these ex rent, uh, buying a home, renting a home is lower. So they end up spending a lot less on day-to-day -day operation, right? Versus California, where the gas was, what, what was it, $10 a gallon, $7 a gallon, uh, you, you know, versus three, four. You know, so you're talking just that alone being almost double, if not double, right? And then uh, you have all those other expenses that are so much more in California. So in reality, if you put those two companies next to each other and you take out all the expenses, the company that was making $10 million, they might be taking home the same amount of money than the $20 million company in California, and in some cases, maybe even more. So don't don't worry about what somebody else is grossing. Worry about what you're taking home after wow. everything. What's your what are you able to do with what you take home, right? But getting back to what we were talking about, so Ed, you're making this sound like uh, like an office movie is having a nerf. But what are the negatives? There's got to be there's cons. We've heard the cons. What are those? Or the I pros mean, rather? What are the cons? What are the negatives? Come on, Yuri, look at me, look at me. Do I look like I'm living in heaven on earth? I'm 35 years old, and this is what the industry has done to me. So 35? This, yeah, I, I can five. see that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, have uh, a I would have thought 20s, but I, oh, I could be wrong. You're, you're wonderful, please. I can't stand the <laughs> Anyhow, there are a lot of negatives, and I'll tell you the main one is this, because I know owners of moving companies all over the UK, Canada and the United States. And I do hear this. There's no way in heck, Ed Katz, that I'm going to be on call nights and weekends and holidays. When I go home, I go home and that phone goes, we turn that phone off. That's great. You can't be a successful local office mover if you don't have somebody on call or you're, if you're not on call, somebody else is on call when you have a job out. You just have to do it. And yeah. so... And if you're involved in dispatch, your biggest, most profitable, most successful office moves are typically on three-day holiday weekends. So you're going to work. We did the 200 truckload move with the company I sold. I was a relocation consultant in 2005 after I sold Peachtree Movers. We did a 200 truckload move the week of Thanksgiving. It started at noon on Wednesday and it finished on the following Monday, you know, that's when these big companies can can afford to shut down when they're not open anyhow. We did Moose New Year's Day. Now, we gave our employees time to, uh, I don't want to say sober up, but we wouldn't start the jobs on New Year's Day. Oh, let's be real about that, right? <laughs> until like 10 or 11 in the morning. But we did Now, we didn't work Christmas Day, but we did Moose July 4th weekend, Memorial Day weekend, Labor Day weekend. When you're a successful local office mover, you need to be working, generating revenue, and not just Friday evening and Saturday, on Sunday too. We did a lot of our moves on Sunday. We might say to a client, hey, look, we're booked solid on Saturday. Can you move on Sunday? And if you want to go to church in the morning, we have a formula that's estimating accurately. We can start your move at one and finish it by seven or eight Sunday evening. You want to do it after church? Actually, Ed, I was looking for a reason not to have to go to church next Sunday. We want to do it in the morning. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, we'll do it. But anyhow, that aside. We won't so tell you know, anybody. Be, there are a lot of people that don't want to be working nights, weekends, and holidays. So that's a negative, you know. Yeah, unfortunately, in this industry, I think that... I mean, it's a wonderful thing to think about, but it's also something that's extremely difficult to do because reality is this. Whether it's office moving or residential... Mostly people want to move when they're not working, right? which is Saturday, Sunday, holidays and stuff like that. So it's like, and uh, just like when you're talking about office moving, you have to be on call. You know, I have to have somebody that's on call all the time. 
realistically with, with, uh, with us doing the calls for you. So we're involved in all the process. We're not done at the point of sale. So we're still involved answering questions. Somebody's got to be around and be able to answer a question if a customer calls or if God forbid there's an issue, which you know we're involved in that process as well. So we're not like other places out there. We are the Rolls Royce of the call center industry as far as moving goes, because not only do we obtain inventories, not only do we do virtuals, not only do we take deposits, not only do we do all that, we are also there helping and making sure that the move goes smoothly if there is an issue. So we're also there to handle all that, right? So um, would there be... so? Ed, anything else that you would you you would say to our listeners regarding why they should go that route and why maybe they should choose your ser services because oh, wow. of your institute? Well, I'm going to be a victim here for a moment. I'm 78 years old. I'm on a fixed income. Please. I enroll. thought you were 35. Well, I'm, now I need to be a victim because I need more oh, okay. money. I'm on a fixed income. Please enroll in my online office moving training I need the income. I need the money. That's the best, most important reason. I also want to I thank you for that commercial you slipped in there. I really appreciate it. The other thing I want to say is this. It's year round. We're here for you. It's not, yeah. It's not seasonal, Yuri. You are just as busy November, December, January, February as you are in the summer. It's interesting. If I had any slow months Looking back over the 24 years when I owned Peachtree Movers, if I had any slow month, it was August. Why? That's when owners of companies go on vacation. And they wanted to be there when there was a move of their company. So that seemed to taper off a little bit. But we were working 12 months out of the year. And uh, that, that's the commitment you have to make. There is one other negative that I like this. I'm going to be honest here. You know, transparency, pros, cons cons you need to invest in a lot of rolling stock now we did four million dollars worth of revenue which is seven and a half million today in terms of u.s dollars inflation all that we owned a thousand four wheel dollies a thousand you got to keep up with all that, that equipment you can't be buying equipment every day every week every month every right. year every year. you have got to learn and know how to keep up with it that's a major investment you know a stack of dollies Twenty dollars times fifty. That's that's that. I don't know. I can't do the math. <laughs> fifty dollars. Fifty times twenty is that a thousand dollars? One stack of dollars, and you lose one stack, you leave it behind. That's a thousand dollars. We own fifty thousand dollars worth of four wheel dollies. Our dollies were top of the line at the time. They were fifty dollars each. You got to keep up with them. That's a lot of money you're tying up in the equipment of rolling stock so that you right. don't stack it floor to ceiling so you can keep it on the floor on the you know on, on the truck. The other thing is this cash is king. And that's a cliche. Like what does that mean? Like if you run out of cash, even though you have a profit, you're out of business. You gotta, you know, collect what you bill. Most movers today who are in the office moving arena, believe it or not, if the move is a five thousand dollar mover less, they get paid up front before they render the service. You have to. And if it's more than $5,000, $10,000, 20 dollars 50 they get 50% down. And then they can't wait 60, 90 days for the money because the cost of money is too expensive. You've got to have that cash flow, cash flow right. coming. So you can do your payables, pay your labor, pay your taxes, pay your utilities, pay your rent. So you got to be a good manager of money. You've got to know your financials and you've got to, you know, manage them like you've managed anything else. I'm sorry. I interrupted you there. No, 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 no problem. So getting back to what you were saying. So, so Ed, uh, if your listeners want more information about your online office moving training, how do they contact you? Call me at 404-358. 2172-404-358-2172 or go to my website, Office Moves, M-O-V-E-S, officemoves.com. And you can see right at the top a banner for movers. Click on that. You'll see everything you need to know. I'd love to talk to you. I really would. All I'm looking for at my age, at my stage of the game is this, an open mind that wants to become more successful 
and be open to new ideas. It, it's the, the difference between household good and, and commercial office moving. It's like the difference between night and day. Unfortunately, a lot of players in the industry don't know that and they dabble in it and they, they don't collect what they bill or they have terrible claims because they didn't know what they were doing. But you, it's, it's not a, it's not qualitatively hard to learn. It's quantitatively hard to learn. It's a lot to learn. That's really what it is. Okay. Well, Ed, thank you so much for joining us for, for our podcast. Once again, it's been a real pleasure. I'm sure we'll have you on again at some point. That would be awesome. And as always, as the world moves on its own, let the professional move yours for you. Once again, Great. thank you very much for joining uh, me for our podcast. And we will see you soon. Thank you, Yuri. It's been a thank real you very much, Ed. It's a pleasure. Mm -hmm.